Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Blandon Thomas, and today I'll be talking about liberation theology, the theological response of marginalized individuals. Um, but first, I just kind of want to give a quick introduction of myself. Um, once again, my name is Blandon Thomas. I'm a, I'm a husband. I'm a Christian. I'm a father. Um, and something you might not know is that I am a avid movie lover. So I am a consider myself a film buff. Uh, I love all forms of cinema and film, and I appreciate and like to critique it. So how many other film buffs do we have in here? Just liking the genre. OK, so great. Um, nobody else watches movies. That's great. <laughs> um, so I like you know drama, suspense, uh, classic, romantic comedies. but. Um, as a culture, I know that we like to root for an underdog, right? So we like to see the person who started at the bottom finally get their retribution, redemption, revenge at the end on the people who we call or classify as the antagonists uh, to their story. So uh, let's name some classic underdog films. Let's, I, I just want you guys to interact with me. So name one. All right, Pursuit of Happiness. What's another one? Rocky, okay, classic, classic underdog. Friday Night Lights, Friday Night Lights. another one. Harry Potter. Harry Potter, <laughs> there we go. Anastasia. Good times. Good, okay. <laughs> Anastasia, okay, all right. So one of my favorite underdog films, and I'm, I, I'm putting myself out there, this is being recorded, is Mean Girls, okay? Uh, I love it, I love the fact that it is well-written, it's comedic, it's subtle, it has all of these things involved in it, right? And it has our classic protagonist underdog. We have Katie Herring, who everybody pronounces her, her name as what? Caddy, you know? They never even get her name right in this. And so she comes from Africa, set into this American Western society, and she's immediately placed into the caste system of high school, right? Um, so she meets the antagonist, as we see, or want to call her Regina George. And she comes up with this plan that hatches this plan to overtake or liberate the system from Regina George, right? Um, but there's a pivotal moment in the movie that I love, and it comes as this illumination as Caddy is, Katie, uh, <laughs> is at the, the math competition. And she is posed up against her other female uh, competitor. And she realizes that denigrating her isn't going to change anything. She can talk about her snaggle too. She can talk about the way she dresses. She can talk about if she's fat that doesn't make her skinnier. She can talk about her being sm not smart. It doesn't make her smarter. So understanding right there that denigrating the people who we are in opposition with doesn't change the issue. We have to solve the problem that's put before us. And so the story continues, and they have like a campy ending. But I think that's the most pivotal part. How do marginalized individuals respond to external obstacles? OK? So I first like to want to, I want to define terms here. So let's talk about liberty. What do we think about when we hear the word liberty? Freedom. 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 What else? A bell. A bell. A bell. You think about the Liberty Bell, right, right. <laughs> Classic, iconic symbol, right? But we think about freedom. We think about man's need and nature to be free of these constraints. So that's what we see in this classical definition of liberty, the absence of obstacles to achieve a desired end, all right? The biblical liberty, as we see, is a freedom to choose rightly. Before we can see in, a, in, a, in the Christian perspective that we were once slaves to sin, and now Christ has given us a, a biblical liberty to choose not to sin anymore, to choose rightly, to choose righteousness. But there's still this, this dealings with the heart of man that we want to be free. We see it in the Bible that we want to be liberated from all other obstacles in our way. Um, we, we probably, not everybody in this room would probably classify ourselves as liberals, 
But in the classical sense of the word, we all are. Man is. We want to seek to free ourselves from these natural obstacles. So what is liberalism? We're talking about liberation theology. Let's get down to root words. So liberalism is an ideology ideology, can't talk today, <laughs> aimed at achieving supreme and complete freedom through the liberation of the individual from secular places, relationships, memberships, and even identities, unless they have been chosen and can be revised or abandoned at will. And that comes from Patrick Deneen, Why Liberalism Failed. I love this book, I, I, not only because it speaks about political thoughts and philosophies, but it also gets down to theology and understanding how people want to see themselves, how they identify with themselves. Um, in this room, I'm sure that the majority of the people aren't doing the job of their parents, the same career path that their parent has done. Um, but historically, that's what it was. If your father was carpenter or a plumber or whatever kind of trade, that's what the sons would become, that they would take on that family business. But what our society has come to is that liberty or liberalism has freed you from that. You can, you can take on a different career goal. You can move from your home country to another country. These are some of the goods that liberalism or that liberal thought has given us. But what we're gonna examine tonight is those extreme thoughts, those extreme factions of this con continuous progressive liberalism that seeks to free us from everything, every chosen, unchosen relationships that we have, redefining ourselves, deluding ourselves in realities that, that don't make sense to other people. And, and effectively, they dishonor God. So what are some tools of liberalism that we see? Um, we see that different states are tools of liberalism. We live in, if you live in a blue state, a red state, if we want to talk political, but those states have different governing rules and authorities. So you can choose whichever state you want to, depending on what rules you want to follow. Um, technology. Technology is a main form of liberalism that we use every day. We have it right here. And this, more than not, liberates us from human interaction as we see progressively. Um, and funny enough, we use it as dating options, meeting new people, but it continually frees us from that. Um, no more do you have to look to um, your mother or your father to arrange your marriage or for you to even be a person as a man to pursue a woman. You can go on any one of these sites and swipe left and swipe right. That takes out a complete human element of a long courtship or getting to know one another, being in a relationship, having long conversations. You can be whatever you want to be. Um, we've seen this time and time again in a show that, unfortunately, sometimes I like to watch Catfish. <laughs> I like to see why people are doing the things that they're doing. What, what motivates them to want to become a completely different person? Why do they feel like the person who God has made them to be is not good enough? So you create a completely different persona online just to draw attraction to from another person, but they're not really even being attracted to you. They're being attracted to someone else completely. So what Patrick Deneen does is in this book, he emphasizes these three terms, citizen, consent, and consumer. Um, we've redefined these terms. As citizen, we typically think about um, our allegiance politically to a state, but um, as Brian um, has put in one of his sermons, or Dr. Hebert, for those who know him better, uh, he put in his sermon, neighboring. At the heart of citizenship is for us to be good neighbors to one another, be polite, courteous, hospitable. Um, but we only think of it as you're a citizen of this nation and I'm a citizen of this nation. And if you are a citizen of the nation who I have qualms with, I don't have to be nice to you. I don't have to be civil to you. I don't have to even like you. Um, which is not the, the basis of that. Consent has, is another term that we've reinvented and turned on its head. Um, we live in a post Me Too era right now, so the word, the hot button word is consent. I have to consent to everything. I have to have my consent in every relationship that I have. 
And really, that's a, just another tool of liberation, liberation, liberalism. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. Um, but it's just another term that, that we use to try to free ourselves from the things we don't like. I have to be in consent with my mother even to, for her to give me advice. I have to give this consensualness to it. And, and, and that doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Like your mother is your mother. She raised you. She can, she can glean into your life. She can give you some advice. Um, and it comes after a long stint of being in a relationship with someone. Um, but we don't see that now. We, we see it in this hookup era. Um, you know, we, we're looking at forms of consent um, as far as intimacy and different relationships. And it just doesn't work out in our, our world. So I'll move on. So what is liberation theology? Liberation theology is a fusion of the Christian theology and Marxism. Um, explaining and interpreting the scriptures, seeking to liberate, liberate marginalized individuals. So let's go to the next question. People might not know what Marxism is, uh, but is it affected our daily lives in a, in a real way? Um, the founders, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, um, it's a philosophy of socio and economic views that illustrates class relations as a power struggle between the oppressed worker, which is the proletariat, and the ruling class, which is the bourgeoisie. Um, <laughs> so in this, it kind of turns it on its head as we see majority and minority. Majority would be the proletariat. It's the working class. It's the people who do all the work, while the ruling class are the ones who, are the ones who can afford for the production to be made. Um, and we see this power struggle in Marxism as something that's inevitably going to fail in a capitalist society, and it's going to have this war and then the proletariat is going to overtake the ruling class and it just ends in chaos. Um, it, it received harsh criticism uh, on its, you know, on its maiden voyage into our philosophy, but it has seeped into our zeitgeist. It has seeped into our media and how we talk to each other and how we think. Um, so what's a marginalized person? Um, and, and, and going through this myself, I had to reframe what I thought about a marginalized person because then it lends to all the different types of liberation theology that pop up. So a marginalized individual is one who, is, ha, who perceives themselves to be treated as insignificant or peripheral. That means on the fringe of society, like an outcast. Um, one who has been kept powerless or unimportant in position within society or a group. Um, and the last one is really interesting. Uh, someone who feels like their voice has been suppressed. How many people in this room have ever felt like they haven't had a voice at one time or another? Raise your hands high. Let's, let's see. Let, let everybody else see. Have you felt like you don't have a voice? Look at all the other marginalized people next to you then. <laughs> right? So what do we do? What do we, what do, where, where, did, where did liberalism come from, this liberation theology? Whereas we can see the, the two fathers of liberation theology started in the 1950s and 60s, um, the person on the, who is, what, what is this? This is my right or my left? That's our left, this is our right. Thank you. I can't, I can't <laughs> tell direction today. Anyway, Gustavo Gutierrez is from Peru, and he was the one who started the the Latin American liberation theology. And the person on my left, your right, is James H. Cone. In the United States, he started the Black Liberation Theology Movement. Both of these movements came out of the, the great disparity between the poor and the rich in the countries. Um, in Peru, the poverty level uh, for the Peruvian nation was, was stark um, in contrast to the rich, um, and especially in the church structure. So he sought a way to allow those marginalized individuals to have a voice, to feel like they belonged. Um, and so he used what he had at his disposal, which was his theology. Um, James Cone did the same thing. Um, in the 1950s, 60s, the beginnings and heights of the civil rights movement, um, allowing um, black people, or whatever term you like to use, political term, African-Americans, in this country to feel like they had a voice. Um, and not saying that the need to have a voice is a bad thing, but if that is the, 
If that is your ruling thing in your life, if you need to be heard above all else, it can be a very dangerous thing. A lot of people don't believe that, but it is. Um, so in, in this rise, it was, it, was a, it was a book that he put out, um, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, a Theology of Liberation in 1971. And the book is based on the understanding that humans are seen as a res assuming responsibility for their human destiny. And yet Christ liberates the human race from sin, which has its roots in all disruption of friendship and injustice. So he was the one who popularized the term preferential treatment for the poor and also asserted that God has preference to those who are insignificant, marginalized, unimportant, needy and defenseless. Gutierrez emphasized orthopraxy, which is proper behavior over proper belief or orthodox, which is proper doctrine. And then he came under harsh criticism. James H. Cohn was an American theologian best known for his advocacy for black theology and black liberation theology. In 1969, his book, Black Theology and Black Power, provided a new way to comprehensively define the distinctiveness of theology in the black church. So once again, we're recapping. Here's the history of liberation theology. It began as a movement interpreted from the scriptures through the lens of the poor. And according to liberation theology, true Christians must work towards social and political change. Any legitimate church will work toward giving preferential treatment to any individuals who has a, who've been historically deprived of their rights. So here was their scriptural support right here. We can find it in Luke 1, 52 through 53. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich has been sent away empty. Matthew 10, 34. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. So to them, this was, these were the scriptures they used to, to ignite the flame of social change and liberation in their countries. Um, but what's dangerous with that is it falls short of the real gospel implication. Um, so, so liberation theology has moved far beyond his introductory message and his broadness scope to give other movements a home and a voice. So liberation theology goes wrong in a couple of places, and I want us to kind of park here for a moment and, and examine those things. For one, it places social action on equal footing with the gospel message. And so as important as it is in feeding the hungry, it cannot take the place of the gospel of Christ. So let's, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Acts 6. So I'll read it. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overworked in the daily serving of food. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we put in charge of this task. But we must devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. As we can see right there, we can see a, another scriptural that doesn't jive with <laughs> liberation theology. It's saying that, yes, we should pay attention to social issues, but they cannot be the, the foundation and they can't be center in the gospel message. They must be as a result of our understanding of the gospel message. Man, mankind's primary need is spiritual and it's not social. Also, the gospel is for all people, including the rich. We see Luke 10, Luke 2, sorry, and 10, as we see when Christ is being born, there were visitors both from the Magi and for shepherds. Everybody had a place. Both groups are welcome. To assign a special status to any group as being preferred by God is to discriminate and to be in direct contradiction to God's word. It says in Acts 10, 34 through 35, Christ brings unity to his church. 
not division among socioeconomic and racial and, and gender lines. So I'm just gonna give two examples tonight of some subsets of liberation theology. The first will be feminist theology, and then the next will be Christian identity. So first we see feminist theology, which is the view that reconsiders the tradition and practices and scriptures from a feminist point of view. An increasing role of women reinterpreted male dominated imagery and language about God and denouncing patriarchy for that of a matriarchal view. So this right here also gained its voice in the 1960s and 1970s, um, kind of following on the back of, of civil rights and, and for a long period of time, there had been some missteps in women in the church. We, we, can't, we can't negate that, we're not negating that. However, the solution is not to throw away the whole Bible. The solution is not to rewrite the Bible because it is infallible, it's inerrant, and it's our, our objective value of truth, right? So when we begin to tamper with that, when we get to add and subtract from that, we also dishonor God. But these women didn't feel like that. They were like, they were also ignited by having their voices heard. And um, here's some notable writers. Um, one of the first is Mary Daly, an author and feminist theology, uh, theologian, sorry. Uh, her first book was The Church and the Second, and the Second Sex in 1968. So she created her own theological uh, anthropology based around the context of what it means to be a woman. She created a dualistic thought and, that separated the world into a false image that created oppression and the world of commune, which is the true being, which she thought was wholly, solely a feminist view, a feminine view, a, a, a goddess view, if you will. Um, so Daly considered a foreground and a background. The foreground, which is the false realm, was male dominated. The background, which is female dominated, was the true ground, which was, was true thought. She believed that women were the life energy of the world and that men were the problem. They were the destroyers, they were the destructors, they were the people who enslaved and oppressed, oppressed others. Um, she preached one of her sermons in a church and she asked for all the women to get up and leave at that point. Uh, and they did, and they did. They all left and actually some men left with her. Um, she believed that the church could not be saved as it was. And eventually she departed the church. She left the church um, and left theology altogether and just became a, a feminist philosopher. Here are other two female theologians, um, Carol P. Christ and Rosemary Radford Ruther. So if there was a father, there are two fathers, these would be two mothers of feminist theology. Um, Carol P. Christ wrote, Why Women Need the Goddess. Um, and Rosemary Radford Ruther wrote, Sexism and God Talk Towards a Feminist Theology. These two women argue that Christianity is spiritually violent against women um, and that it was dangerous for women to even practice found, fundamental foundational theology, um, which caused much chaos. Um, they, uh, Carol P. Christ started the Goddess Movement in 1978, um, which was the, what we would see most commonly now as the Gaia Movement, um, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, um, and she felt like that the Bible had been hijacked by men. And so that instead of all of the, the he pronouns, that if we just replace it with a she pronoun, that the Bible will be correct. Uh, once again, we see this as dangerous revisioning of history. Um, and uh, yeah. The next thing we'll talk about is Christian identity. So Christian identity is an ethnically driven view of Christianity. It emphasizes white supremacy. Uh, a lot of you might have questions of why this is a part of liberation theology. Um, I, would, I would challenge you to open your mind. Um, 
what society puts on us is that all white people are in power, they have a voice, they're in charge, and they never feel like they don't have a voice. Well, this is just not true. White people, black people, we're people. And sometimes we don't feel like we have a voice. And right here, this was them trying to struggle to get their voice. They felt like their history and that their, their culture was being endangered, and this is their response to it. Um, we might not agree with it, but they also felt marginalized. We saw how many hands raised among this classroom, I mean, not classroom, this room, <laughs> uh, when we asked who felt marginalized. So um, if you feel like your voice is suppressed, you are a marginalized individual by definition. So this holds that only Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, Nordic, Aryan, and Germanic people are the true descendants of the ancient Israelites. So this is really interesting. Um, this traces back to the 1840s when John Wilson was fascinated with the fate of the lost 10 tribes um, described in the Bible and a series of lectures published. He asserted that these tribes had migrated across the Caucasus Mountains, which were called Caucasians, and were in fact the people who eventually inhabited the Northern European and the British Isles, which led him to create British is Israelites. So he believed that his research showed that these lost tribes migrated. So what he knew as um, native or ethnic Jews weren't really chosen people of God, that the chosen people of God had migrated to the Caucasus Mountains. It has its flaws, but he, he had a lot of followers. So we see right here, uh, Howard Rand and Wesley Swift. Howard Rand was the person who coined the phrase Christian identity. Howard Rand started as a British Israelite and made his transition identifying as Christian identity when he was received favorably in the Americas in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, Wesley Swift was a former Methodist minister from Southern California, and he was famous for his radical views, including the denial of the Holocaust. Um, once again, we, we talked about delusionment up front, um, and if you seek to liberate yourself from all obstacles, um, what he had to do was free himself from the, the horrible imagery of the, of the Holocaust. And so that's what he did. So he was a Holocaust denier. He was one of the original Holocaust deniers. Um, so he had a radio show, um, which was interesting, that, that had a lot of viewers at the time. And was, he was considered one of the most single most significant figures in the early years of the Christian identity movement in the United States. He was responsible for one of the, the main chambers of the uh, main, main sects of the Ku Klux Klan and is associated with the militant Christian group called the California Rangers. So here are the tenets of Christian identity. Um, that you had to be an Anglo-Saxon, that you had to be white, the white people were the real God's chosen people from a descendant in an unbroken line from Adam and Eve. So they are by nature the superior race. They believe that the Jews derived from Cain himself as a product of, of a sexual liaison between Eve and the serpent. Um, Non-whites or pre-Adamite beings were soulless beings. So me standing before you, I would have no soul in, the, in their minds. Um, and they're said to be biblical beasts of the field, uh, that Cain made it with these people to produce today's Jews and blacks. Um, that Jews are part of a satanic plot to unite the world under a single government to be taken over ultimately by the devil himself. This plot is thousands of years old is what they believe. Whites in America, the true house of Israel, must battle bl bloodily to usher in the period of godly rule prior to the second coming. This means a race war. Once again, these, these views are controversial, they, but we need to see them. We need to see and hear the voices that are out there. We can't be blind to them, so we then can first combat them rightly, not with anger, because this is what this is saying. This is, this is what ignites all of this, this blind anger, this blind hatred um, for everyone. So I, I want to leave on this memory verse because next week I'll be back and I'll be demonstrating uh, two more um, highly volatile sects, which will be black liberation theology and black Hebrew Israelites. 
Um, so I want to leave you with this, Colossians 2 and 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Understand the position. We need to be in Christ in our thinking and our philosophy and what we believe through the lens of our worldview, not through something that has come out of hatred and anger and anxiety and frustration, but that has come from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you.